It's a rainy, dark night as the mustard green pinto pulls onto the poorly lit side street off of Beale. The air is a mixture of swamp and whatever soapy solution the dimly lit bars and restaurants use to wash away the vast amounts of alcoholic regurgitation. A vile smell that makes the man driving shudder because the vice grips that replaced his broken win window regulator has slid back too far under the imitation leather slash duct tape seats. What am I doing here, he thought, as he traveled further down the road and the city street turned into a mixture of stone and gravel as it snaked further into the swamp. He drove th through the darkness toward his destination, wondering if this place existed at all. Days earlier, in a small comic shop on a forgotten side street, the man was rummaging through a water-damaged box of We Priced Them From eBay Comics when something caught his eye. It was a mint copy of the Savage Dragon number one for only 17 bucks. Obviously, the proprietor didn't know what he had. When Jackson approached the counter, the man behind it was wearing a masquerade mask. And he wondered, is this guy on his way to a party? It's not uncommon during this, this time of the year. Well, they chatted a little bit as he purchased his treasure, but something about the man who introduced himself as Bill, it just seemed familiar. Anyways, he took the paper bag and he walked back to his car in the rain. But when he got into the almost dry seat of his Pinto, he opened the bag and he was shocked. For where his precious savage dragon should have been, now there was only a small antique book, leather bound. He ran back down the alley and to his surprise, when he reached the store, the door was locked and the interior was completely empty. No comics, no antiques, and no bill. The only thing that remained was a single masquerade mask in the middle of the floor of an empty room. Hours later, in his bedroom slash kitchen slash laundry room that also doubled as his restroom, uh, he thumbed through the old manuscript. It was written in a familiar handwriting, and as he searched the dusty yellow pages, he began to unfold a tale that he couldn't believe. It was a fantastic story of a shack hidden in the swamp outside of New Orleans, where a man desperate for riches and power could play a game of wits with a voodoo woman. The book explained that if you could find the woman and she invited you into her shack, that she would grant you a wish or two. The story was fantastic, but so intriguing that he read all night until he reached the pages that should have given the exact location of the shack, except the pages were blank. He thought of his future and his incomplete comic collection, and he made a decision that would change his life. He would search for the shack in the swamp that surely had been lost to time, but he had a problem. How would he find the information that should have been on those last two pages? As he was eating dinner later that night, and of course reading comics, he placed the book on the side table, and in his hurry to grab his tumbler of Game Fuel Mountain Dew, he spilled it onto the blank page. The reaction of the acid and all the evil chemicals and sodas, and the ink, as it dried on the pages, caused it to reveal the location. And then on the very last page, it gave him the, a phrase to say before entering the cabin. So the next day, he began his search, talking to the business old owners in the original historic part of town. No one knew anything about the story or the woman, or at least they wouldn't talk to him about it. Finally, he had a stroke of luck when an old man on a park bench relayed to him the story of a French princess who had been brought to America in the late 18th century, outcast by her father for practicing witchcraft. The man knew what he had to do. He is beyond lost, far back into the swamp on the single-lane road, when its headlights begin to flicker. Barely bright enough to catch a glimpse of a large, glimpse of a large metal gate with a picture of Alexander the Great riding a tiger? There are multiple Egyptian obelisk statues. They dot the yard of the shack. And a ship's captain's wheel made of stone. Among other items of historic significance. 
His car slows to a crawl as the silhouette of the shack comes into view. So he shuts off the ignition and steps out of the Pinto. The small path ahead is almost luminescent with the dark swamp around him. And he starts freaking out. He grabs his phone out of the cup holder. And to his luck, it's dead. He knows that he should try to go back, but his headlights are out. There's no way he would make it back through the swamp. So with the courage of a starship captain, he puffed up his chest and he walked right up and right before his knuckles could hit the door of the broken down swamp shack, the door swung inward. The woman who answered the door wasn't what he expected at all. It was a young French noblewoman with the prettiest smile you ever could have seen. She said, won't you come in and have coffee? with the prettiest French accent you had ever heard. No way this is real, he thought, as he almost stepped right inside, but then he snapped back to reality, remembering what he was supposed to say before entering. Presto changeo, Star Trek is better than Conan, he chanted, and immediately her image changed, and he saw that she was in fact not the young noblewoman, but a frail old woman who kind of looked like the neighbor lady who was after Dorothy's dog on the Wizard of Oz. She didn't react. She just turned and walked toward the table and told him to come on in for tea. As she made the tea, she explained that she's been waiting for him, that he is the chosen one, and he is the first to ever take interest in her love of Star Trek and not just the image of her younger self as the disavowed princess. As it turns out, the old lady might be crazy, but she tells him that because he is chosen, she is going to grant him two and a half wishes and ask him what he would like. He thought for a moment, and he said, I want to be immortal, or close, kind of like Superman. Uh, I want to be invincible, and I want to time travel. She smiles and says, done. The next instant, he is falling through the air high above the earth, hurling toward the ground as he braces for impact. He knows it will surely kill him, but miraculously, it doesn't. When he stands up, he's on a mountain above a beautiful, lush landscape of mountains and trees. He turns, and beside him is the princess. What's going on? he asks, startled by the experience. She then explains to him that she was once a powerful witch, and she has granted his wishes. But now... He is almost immortal, he has the strength of ten men, and the only problem she has is sometimes the half of which doesn't work out. So, while he did get to time travel, it brought him to 30 BC, and unfortunately, it was a one-way trip. She then tells him that she can no longer stay, and that she hopes he will teach the early man to survive, and most importantly, to be excellent to each other. She disappears, and as he stands there, he spots some natives watching him from behind a tree. They had told the other people in the village that they had seen him fall from the sky, so now he is accepted from the, by the people as a visitor from the gods. So, for a thousand years he has waited throughout history as a lonesome immortal on the path to where he began, changing identities shaping history, living many lives as paupers, kings, philosophers, inventors, warlords. Rumor has it, he was the one who taught early man how to draw pictures on rock faces and on cave walls, and so the first comic strip was invented. It was said that he was responsible for the Dark Ages, but he finally made amends by pushing people like Michelangelo and da Vinci into the Enlightenment period. He shaped men like Washington and Jefferson, and the way I understand it, when old Ben Franklin was testing his theory of electricity, it was Jackson's key that Ben borrowed for his kite. Decades and centuries have passed, and finally, with his wisdom and knowledge of the future, he reached a time where the comic strip and the comic book had blossomed. He rubs elbows with the greats like Kirby and Lee and 
all the other ones shaping the pop culture bubble. He was almost solely responsible for creating NBC and for getting the ball rolling for the show Star Trek. Ultimately settling down in rural Louisiana, creating a YouTube channel where he can watch some of his favorite videos from people like Genome Presents, The Gray Man, and Matilda Gothica. Now he lives carefully, trying to avoid his future self who disappeared to the past that fateful night in early 2023. So to answer your question of where in the world is Jackson Roykirk, he's right here. He's been here the whole time, patiently waiting for this contest and for his return to the only thing he truly loves, dare I say, lives for, for reading comic books and for giving comic mag musings a hard time to go on YouTube.